Welcome to The Roll Forward, a podcast for the next wave of finance leaders, especially those looking to transform their roles by making smarter, faster, and more profitable business decisions using the power of technology and a forward-looking approach to finance. Listen in to learn how to get out of the back office trenches and become a more strategic partner within your organization. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Roll Forward Podcast. I'm Joe Garofalo and this episode is brought to you by Mosaic, a strategic finance platform that transforms the way business gets done. Today, I'm here with Graham Stanton, who co-founded Peloton in 2012. During his time there, he wore multiple hats, overseeing everything from technology to legal to the people team, performance marketing, and most notably for our podcast, he oversaw finance. Um, Graham, Graham scaled Peloton from the startup uh, back in 2012 to the household name that it is today. And he's taken all that experience and, and co-founded a company called Advise, which is aiming to unlock the power of accounting to help drive business forward. Graham, thanks so much for joining me today. We're super excited to have you on the Roll Forward podcast. Uh, can you give the audience a, a quick introduction and a little bit of background on yourself? Yeah, well, thank you, Joe. Uh, really happy to be here. Um, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, and that, that that was a pretty good intro right there. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll throw in that uh, yeah, I, I started my career as a software engineer uh, before moving to the business yeah, to the business side uh, a few years out of college. Uh, but yeah, I always kind of you know took that software development analytical you know, view to things, um, and you know maybe that gave me a lower tolerance for using back, uh, bad software for any function. Uh, I love that and. That kind of brings us to our, our topic for today's conversation, which is really focused around um, the CFO tech stack and, and back office technology. And um, Graham, in a Forbes article that was that was highlighting advice in the new company that you're building, you mentioned something about having a career long frustration with with back office technology and with finance tooling. Uh, can you explain a little bit about uh, that frustration and how it led you to start advice? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, and I. I... I can say in general, um, yeah, I always had a, a, the sort of a bad view of back office software. Um, yeah, my my first paid programming job was um, in an IT department um, yeah, at some corporation where yeah, the people developing the software kept blaming the users for bad data in the system, and you know, I wanted to pull my hair out saying, you know, "Oh, it's your bad software," and that's leading to that. Um, but you know, that, that was late 90s, and unfortunately, nothing's improved since then, um, for the most part. Um, you know, starting to see some green shoots now. Um, but yeah, when I, when I was at Peloton, um, you know, I was kind of right in the middle of it. Um, you know, everything, everything we used was clunky. Um, I mean, we, we used QuickBooks Desktop, which, you know, did its job. It, it, it was fine. Um, but nothing more than that. Anytime we tried to go beyond kind of you know, what it offered out of the box. Yeah, you know, we hit some real, real big issues. Um, you know, and then at one point we, we had to upgrade to an ERP. And, and that's when I learned that yeah, sort of real enterprise technology you know, is, is worse than you know, anything I'd seen up to that point. For sure. Uh, talk a little bit more about that ERP transition. I've, I've been through some, some really long implementations, uh, I think, when they go well, it takes at least six months. Uh, and when they go not so well, it could take up to a year. How was your transition? Oh, uh, I think it was two years, um, or, or more, um, yeah, depending on what, yeah, what you count as done. Um, it was, um, I mean, it was a big disillusionment. I mean, I didn't, I'd never used an ERP before. Um, we'd gotten to a point at Peloton when, you know, we had a fairly complex business and, it was it was tough, you know. It was tough to keep track of everything, um, you know, both from the standpoint of getting the books done, to actually understanding the business, um, and you know, I foolishly thought that moving to an ERP would solve both of those problems. Um, I mean, it's right there in the name, enterprise resource planning. I mean, it, it, that's what these systems are designed to do. And um, yeah, but from my perspective, and moving to an ERP really just added a huge headache. Um, and there was a necessary evil. There, there was, you know, no alternative. Um, any alternative would have been worse. But, um, you know, in terms of closing our books, in terms of like, getting our accounting done, and in terms of understanding our business, uh, it, all that progress was done based on, you know, custom internal work. 
Yep. And yeah, the, the off the shelf software, you know, the very expensive off the shelf software that you know required you know really hordes of people to operate. You know, a bunch of in house hires, um, implementers, um, consultants, two consultants, you know, just on and on. Um, it didn't add to that process. I mean, it, it was a useful repository of the end result uh, of some of the data we generated, but even then it was only a summary. Um, so we could produce our financial statements from it, but we had to do a lot of custom work to get the data in. And then any analysis, like the granularity wasn't in the system. So we needed to use other platforms anyway. Graham, I've had a lot of the same frustrations around the ERP system being more of this uh, backwards looking newspaper from last month. Uh, not really driving any of the analysis, especially not in real time. What were some of the other tools that you used at Peloton that helped plug the gaps uh, that the ERP couldn't fill? Yeah, I mean, I, I really like that you know, view of you know, what an ERP is. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's so slow and, it, and, and it's, you know, it's really just the headlines. Um, and, and that's assuming you're using it right in the first place. Um, yeah, you can't use it to drive your business. So. At Peloton, we had, um, you know, I've mentioned, we had a number of internal systems, um, you know, external systems. So we, had, we built our own e-commerce system and, you know, we integrated with Stripe to take payments. Um, you know, we had our own, we had our own system, obviously, for, you know, for tracking workouts, um, you yeah, know, for doing the subscription uh, billing and tracking and, you know, various external systems for deliveries, et cetera. And, uh, yeah, really to our only hope to close the gaps was to pull all that data into a data warehouse, um, you know, which was very separate from the ERP. Um, it required a dedicated team and just to get the data in there. And then we put, we put Looker on top yep. um, and yeah, we had countless, we had countless Looker reports. And, you know, I, I think at, at one point I counted um, 800 Looker views wow. um, to go into that. Um, and, and yeah, hundreds of uh, canned reports on top of those, uh, maybe thousands. Um, and, and then, yeah, that was only kind of sort of usable uh, for the business team. So yeah, we also had data analysts whose job it was to pull reports you know, on request or you know, kind of configure it exactly as, um, you know, as people needed. And, and that got us our real-time information um, it meant that the uh, the turnaround on new analysis was, you know, depending on the proficiency of the user, maybe a little slower than ideal, um, and you know one of the, you know, one of the weaknesses was it didn't necessarily tie to the core financials you know, just because of you know, the way the data flowed. I mean, it was all in theory accurate, um, but that led to another big headache uh, when we were getting ready to go public and needed to guarantee that absolutely everything tied down to the penny. Uh, totally, uh, especially with all the accounting to gap and, and cash effects that, that happen through multiple sets of data. It's really hard to, to tie that granular transaction data to your headline financial numbers um, and have that beautiful bridge that mm -hmm. connects the dots. Um, when you think about like the, the pieces of the modern CFO tech stack, what are some of the characteristics or features that you think um, will make the back office less painful in the future? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a good question. Um, I mean, for sure that you know that real time view is going to be critical. I mean, any company that you know actually changes from month to month, you know, isn't going to be satisfied looking at last month's data, um, you know, or data that's two months old if if the close actually takes an additional month. Um, and I think you know the the other part really is usability. And yeah, I, th I think that we're getting to a point where yeah, people aren't accepting that, oh, this tool like gets the job done, but it's a huge pain to do it. And um, especially startups or modern businesses that have a lot to get done. Yep. And there's not, yeah, there's not going to be so much tolerance for, um, yeah, you can technically do this. I mean, it feels like it should take 20 minutes, but it's going to take you all day or all week. And but you don't have it. You, you've got things to do to actually drive the business forward. Yep. I love that. Um, and even when you mention a tool like Looker, which we absolutely love, um, there is a, a pretty steep learning curve to mm -hmm. get a tool like Looker up and running to have the, uh, the look ML to write those queries that produce all the metrics that you need. Um, so I think for, for the future of the modern CFO tech stack, that skill set 
to wrangle and manipulate that data needs to get a bit easier. And it also needs to be in the hands of, of people like us leading the finance team versus the engineering folks who, who, who do know how to manipulate that data at a mass scale. Um, another topic that I, I really like that uh, I saw you talk about in the Forbes article is this concept of consumer grade enterprise technology. I think one of the things that Peloton has really nailed was making the fitness industry, which was, you know, kind of old, older and um, less, less futuristic, feel really friendly um, and feel really new and fresh. That same approach, I think, that you took to Peloton needs to be taken to uh, financial technology and specifically that of the, the CFO tech stack. Can you talk a little bit about um, consumer friendly design based product for finance? Yeah, it, absolutely. And um, yeah, it, it's definitely a parallel. Um, yeah, I think the in the fitness space, yeah, there, yeah, to the extent that there were any electronics, yeah, integrated into equipment, it was blinking lights in a circle. <laughs> um, in 2012, I went to a an equipment conference, and um, one of the manufacturers very eagerly showed me their new iPad app that was literally an iPad app of blinking lights in a circle, and the, it, it's the attitude of like, well, you're doing a workout because you know you're supposed to or you have to, so you'll put up with anything. Um, and, and it's the same attitude for back office software. You know, it's like, well, you know, these people are paid to do it. Um, you know, we actually heard recently from someone who met with um, a, sales a sales representative from one of the top ERPs, you know, seven figure per year software, where the salesperson outright told them, well, we're not going to win any usability awards. And, but, you know, they, they get the job done, you know, technically, supposedly. Um, yeah, and, and, you know, as I was talking about a, a little bit, um, you know, with the previous question, they, they, you know, modern company, people don't have the time for that. Um, and people are losing the patience for that. Um, and we already have this world of consumer software that, you know, that, that's always been the case where you know, consumers you know, will only, you know, will only use software that is intuitive, that, you know, they enjoy using. And, and if it's not, they'll move on. Um, and people are starting to have that same attitude to, you know, toward the software that they have to use for work. Um, so I do think that there's a real opportunity here just to, you know, kind of take some of the same people who've built consumer software and some of the same mindset and be, you know, inspired by these people and, and say, well, you know, let's just pretend our end users, you know, in a work environment are just as picky as end users in a consumer environment and, you know, build it as if it was, you know, for the consumers. I love that. It's such a great philosophy. And it's, it's, it's funny that that wasn't a thought with all the prior technology that that was built. And uh, it, it does look like at Avise, you guys were able to bring over Eric Wong, who was the original UX creator of Peloton. How's his transition going from building fitness software to finance software? Yeah, I think I think that one was a real coup. Yeah, Eric, uh, you know, Eric is an old you know, colleague, an old friend of mine. Uh, we, uh, we first worked together, I think it was in uh, 2007 at uh, IAC. Um, yeah, he, he designed all the original screens for Peloton um, you know, and the evolution there for a while. He designed the Peloton logo. Um, yeah, he's, he's got a real eye to um, consumer experiences. Uh, he had never built back office software. He never built any financial software. Um, he had no experience at all in, uh, in this category. And yeah, we had advised that, that that was perfect. Um, yeah, we needed we needed a set of eyes, yeah, unpolluted by uh, all the bad choices that have been made over yeah you know, the past five decades. I love that because when you have when you have that um, that first principles approach, you can make so many things that are uh, just historically accepted better because you're looking at them with a fresh set of eyes. And I think that's exactly what financial software back office CFO tech stack needs uh, for this future wave of technology to, to really win the market. Um, which brings me to uh, our next question here, which is where do you think, uh, where do you stand, I guess, on the, the software versus Excel debate? Um, mm -hmm. Do you think that the future eliminates spreadsheets or just makes up for their weakness? Yeah, I, I think, I, I think, I mean, the, the question is a good one, but it, it's also yeah, sort of a, false dichotomy. Um, Excel has its place. Excel is 
amazing software. It's taken over the world, you know, for a good reason. Um, and, you know, still, I, I mean, I spend a lot of time in Excel or Google Sheets or, you know, some, or whatever spreadsheet tool I'm using. Um, it, it's great for prototyping. And it is, it's great for, you know, one-time analysis. And it's great for that one process that this one company has that's just not, that is completely unique to itself and doesn't fit anywhere else. Yep. And, but yeah, anytime it's being used like a database when, you know, as a source of truth, I, I think that's a big red flag that um, software would be a better choice in this, you know, in this scenario. And, you know, I know that that's often the case on, um, with finance teams. It certainly was for us at Peloton. Um, and, uh, and, and anytime you have an overly complex Excel spreadsheet that's just being used you know, over and over and over again, um, you know, that, that's another sign that, you know, maybe this could have been, you know, better done, you know, in a tool. And, and, and I think, you know, as the tools mature, you know, people will just naturally reach for Excel less and less and it will just live where, you know, where it belongs around the edges. Yep. I love that. I think it'll always have a, a place in in the CFO's tool stick toolkit. Um, but when you only have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And I think that's the world that we've had to live in with kind of the shortcomings of, of technology. Um, and a lot of folks have been burned by those two year long implementations of existing legacy uh, financial tooling. And I think there's going to have to be kind of this this education and this um, next wave of of uh, marketing that happens to to get CFOs thinking that like there actually can be a better way, um, and excited that that you're along the journey helping helping build that next wave. Um, next question for you here, and and this is really for a lot of the Mosaic customers that are listening. Uh, a lot of our customers have different revenue streams. Um, it's hard enough to get the CFO tech stack to produce the outputs that you need when you have one software revenue stream. Um, you guys at Peloton had several. There was the hardware component of the bikes, there was the software, there was the live classes, and uh, everyone here, if they don't already have one, should have some, some Peloton apparel because it's great. <laughs> Can you talk about how the CFO tech stack, um, how you made it work for so many different revenue streams? Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely wasn't easy. And uh, um... Yeah, I'll say that yeah, out of necessity, when as we were building up the finance function and and we were, uh, you know, actually maturing our financials and you know even you know moving towards going public. I mean, we we started off by doing a lot of our um, a lot of our revenue recognition um, and, and yeah, booking uh, yeah just outright booking of revenue based on Excel spreadsheets and you know we. We got to a point when, um, yeah, so the uh, the big Excel spreadsheet now for all hardware revenue um, would crash someone's laptop um, half the time. So it's a, yeah, they'd open it, you know, wait ten minutes, either it would work or their laptop would, yeah, you know, their Excel would crash and they they kill the process and try again. Um, and, and then we partitioned it, yeah, you know, we, we turned it into multiple spreadsheets, um, and, and yeah. Uh, obviously, that doesn't work for analysis. If you want to know, kind of, you know, how's the business doing? You want to start tracking. Um, you want to start tracking revenue per customer. Uh, maybe you're curious about, um, you know, people acquired via this marketing campaign. Can I estimate their LTV? Um, then, yeah, you know, all that. Yeah, you know, if all that data is locked in these spreadsheets um, and not getting into the financials until you know, months later, and that, that's kind of useless. So. We did a lot of this analysis in, you know, in Redshift and Looker, mm -hmm. um, and just yeah, we had custom SQL for parts of it, and it was this big intensive thing, um, and when it worked, it was kind of unfortunate that it took so much effort. And um, when it came time to go public and and make this process SOX compliant, we had a whole other team of engineers build a, you know, a new subledger. Um, yeah, for all revenue that then made its way also to Redshift and in summarized form to our ERP. Yep. And so yeah, giant headache. 
and um, yeah, just just a lot of yeah, kind of duct tape along the way. And I, I think a mature process in the end, but in hindsight, and it it's kind of sad that you know Peloton needed to be you know on the precipice of going public to actually pull it all together. And, and just the, the number of people involved in that is you know painful to think about. Yep, and and that is I think the the world class finance function is when you can take data from all your point solutions use ETL to pipe them into a data database, write code to like join and blend all those different tables together to give you the right views um, so that you can see everything in one place and, and close to real time. And that world-class structure is every company is trying to build it. Um, and it's, it's every company rebuilding it from scratch each time. So I think for the CFO tech stack, there's this chance to build kind of that meta layer that will just snap into all those tools um, and automate a lot of like that, that SQL writing and creating those views so that you can get that stack up and running faster from day one, instead of building it, the, you know, leading up on the roadshow towards the IPO. <laughs> so I think that's a really big area for uh, disruption in the CFO tech stack. Uh, and it's, it's very aligned with what we're trying to build at, at Mosaic. Um, but Graham, thanks so much for talking about some of the pain and the struggles of, of the CFO tech stack at, at Peloton. It's, it's really exciting to hear. Um, question for you now on like just summarizing everything. If you had the right finance and accounting tech stack um, before, before that IPO, what were some of the things or some of the insights that maybe you would have done differently or changed? Hmm. No, that, that's a really interesting question. Um, yeah, surface level improvements. Yeah, would have been. Um, yeah, the CEO never would have needed to think about the letters ERP <laughs> at all. Um, yeah, the, the fact that our, our you know our CFO tech stack implementation ended up being the you know one of the biggest initiatives for the company it was a, a you know, sign of how broken the whole yeah, ecosystem. Yeah, is or at least was, um, so that that already would have been a big deal. But you know, if, if we'd had that, you know, if we'd had that level of insight much earlier on, um, you know, I, I think about just how, how dramatically better our operations would have been. Um, I mean, the you know, we, we were a very fast growing company, and you know, when when you think of the size Peloton is now and you, know, so, you, know, you think if I think, oh, you know, Peloton maybe spent 10% too much in this area um, early on in its existence, you know, that, yeah, that, that's a rounding error in the financials of, of Peloton today. So, you know, it, it's just kind of like, you know, grow fast and, and, and do what you have to do. But the reality doesn't work out that way. I mean, we, we always struggled to raise money until we had you know, a very large number of paying subscribers. Um, yeah, v VCs always doubted the business model. Um, everything was a struggle. And you know, in, in hindsight, was like a lot of that struggle was just you know, kind of poor visibility into the core economics uh, of the engine. They, you know, we knew, you know, we knew what was important for the company and kind of how to prioritize. But in terms of presenting the business, you know, if yeah, if we would have had that insight in terms of like, okay, this is how to do manufacturing. This is yeah, how to do yeah, how to manage our third-party logistics yeah relationship. Um, yeah, I think back to yeah marketing and and the just the sheer amount of work we did on you know insight there. If if we had that properly coupled yeah, to the to the rest of the business, um, you know, we probably would have spent less on marketing in some areas and dramatically more in others. Um, and that. I get frustrated at, at the time sink, you know, due to having you know bad insight um, and and bad software to use. Uh, but the impact of the business is so much bigger than that. I mean, I, you know, it, it could have been the it could have been the difference between success and failure. That I think, yeah, we're lucky we pulled through. Um, yeah, the degree of difficulty was so hard. I, I can only imagine the companies out there that they would be very successful today, but you know, had to close shop before they ever were given a chance. That's such an insightful perspective. I, I would have never guessed that um, with all the success that Peloton has. And 
um, our friend Jack McCullough has, has a really good quote. Um, he says like CEOs should value a CFO that is a really good storyteller. Um, and you can only tell that really good story of the success that Peloton was having if you have good insights into the numbers and you can piece together all of those analytical insights uh, about the supply chain, about the three PLs, about the marketing data to, to tell that story. So it's, it's really cool to hear that, you know, if you had better technology, mm -hmm. that storytelling would have been easier. Obviously it doesn't matter to all those VCs. I think you guys proved them <laughs> very wrong, which is, uh, I always love that. Um, but congrats on all the success. I think last question for you here today is we always ask this to all of our guests. If, if somebody's starting their career in, in finance and aspiring to be a CFO or, or head of finance, what's one thing um, you recommend or, or wish they knew when they were, when you were starting your career? Yeah, I, I think just to, just to stick with the theme of this conversation, um, I, I think a solid understanding of, um, yeah, I guess of data, you know, to, to do it more broadly. Um, yeah, through what we're doing at Avise, I, mean, I, I would tilt that a little bit to, the, it's good to understand accounting, but ultimately accounting is really just, you yeah, the data underlying the business. Um, you know, and it flowing through to then, you know, the story of the business, you can only tell a good story about, yeah, about how the business is doing based on the underlying data. You know, that, that's kind of the CFO's job to be able to interpret the data and tell that story. Um, I think there are a lot of operational aspects of, of being a CFO that, you know, that, that are independent, but almost all of them are helped, um, by having that, you know, really good base, um, you know, for knowing where everything comes from. Yeah. I think that's so true. I mean, a degree in finance, a degree in accounting, those things are table stakes now. And it seems like the, the future is actually. Uh, being able to understand the data and all the different data sources and how to piece them together to tell that that story. So I 100% agree. Um, cool. Before I let you go here, Graham, um, what is your favorite type of, of ride over on the Peloton? <laughs> I myself am a low impact guy, but curious to hear uh, what you enjoy. No, well, I, uh, that's a good question. I mean, I love all of them. I, I, I love the I love the low impact rides as well. I, I, I use them as, as, as fillers, as recovery. <laughs> um, I, I'll go to the extreme opposite, though, and, and say, um, yeah, I, I love the hit and the Tabata um, just for the you know, for how good a workout you can get in in, in such a short period of time. Um, but I've made the mistake of doing those too many, yeah, too often. And uh, yeah, I really got to mix it up. For sure. For sure. Um, well, very cool. Uh, for folks that are looking for information on Avise, and we over at Mosaic are our customers and are really enjoying what you guys are building, kind of unlocking that that accounting function to drive business forward. Where can folks go to learn more about what you're building at Avise? Well, we are. Uh, yeah, we have just recently launched our beta, so uh, yeah, please go to our website, Avise.com, A-V-I-S-E, and um, yeah, just drop your email address in there or you know, feel free to email me directly, graham at advice.com. Cool. Well, Graham, thanks so much for being here. Really enjoyed the conversation and looking forward to uh, staying in touch shortly. Yep. Thanks so much, Joe. Really awesome. enjoyed it. Thanks, Graham. Bye. Thank you for checking out this episode of The Roll Forward. This show is powered by Mosaic, a strategic finance platform that transforms the way business gets done. If you enjoyed what you learned in this episode, make sure to follow The Roll Forward wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Or visit mosaic.tech slash podcast to get immediate access to all of the latest episodes.